Good morning, everybody. Good afternoon. Good evening, depending on uh, where you are. Thanks for connecting to this first in a series of seminars under the overall umbrella of excellence in science. Together with the leadership team, we have identified six important strategies to move uh, CIMIT into the right space so that in 2100, people can say, thankfully, in 2022, those uh, women and men took the right decision, did the right things, so we have a better world right now. That means we are looking at how can we shift from resolving yesterday's problems tomorrow to today resolve tomorrow's problems. In order to get our creativity going, and in order to support one of those six strategies, and the six strategies are excellence in science, excellence in operation, resource mobilization, talent attraction and retention, a strategy related to partnerships, and a strategy related to our influence. How do we influence the top-level global conversations? In our excellence in science strategy, we want to get our creativity going. We want to tap into our thought leaders, as well existing ones as emerging ones. And with this series of seminars, we want to go deep in some of the scientific topics, and we want to listen to some of the non-traditional, broad system thinkers and listen to how they look at what we do here in Summit and what is going on in the world. It's therefore my honor uh, uh, to present today's uh, speaker in the first seminar, which is a science deep dive under the umbrella of the excellence in science. Some of you, and I actually know many of you, know, uh, know Steve Tanksley. Steve is going to today present in the core of what we are trying to resolve all of us, which is actually looking at complex decision-making problems. And he's going to do that as a breeder and from a genetics uh, standpoint. So just alone, this intriguing element, to know that a professor from Cornell moves into complex decision-making problems and then has the audacity to start his own company and be the CEO of that makes me very intrigued about his speech or his presentation today. What different things did he see as CEO versus professor? How from a molecular genet uh, geneticist focusing on selective plant breeding to achieve genetic improvement of crops, he became the CEO of Nature Source Genetics and is combining both skill sets. Steve, the floor is all yours. Parents have taught me that it's not all about you, that you have a purpose if you have skills and abilities you need to use it for others in, in service of your country or the larger world. And he took it a step further and he set up during his time as president something called the Peace Corps, which still exists today. This was essentially a mechanism by which um, men and women, usually young, young people, like from college or high school, would go out in the world and provide some help somewhere in the world, especially in developing countries. So You had a responsibility to give, and that also had a large impact on me. And so when I was uh, finishing up high school, my goal at that time was to go to college, gain some kind of skills, and then join the Peace Corps. And so I, uh, I enrolled in local university, Colorado State University, and not being from a very affluent family, I had to work to pay my tuition bills and housing. Uh, the job I got was as a custodian or a janitor in the student union. It was on the weekends. You get up at 5 a.m. on Saturday and 5 a.m. on Sunday, which, as you probably know, uh, college students don't have much sleep anyway, and getting up at 5 o'clock on the weekends doesn't help any. And on top of that, I had almost no social life because I was working or going to school all the time. But it did pay the bills. But one day, uh, I was taking a break at my job, and I noticed a bulletin board I saw an ad for, they wanted someone who could water greenhouses. It was a paying job in a, in a barley research at a greenhouse. And the job didn't pay as much as my custodian job, but it paid enough, and the hours were better. So I quit my job as a custodian and went to work for a professor named uh, Akuma Sichia. He was a barley breeder and geneticist at the university, and I took care of watering the plants, which wasn't that difficult. Uh, became quite good at it. 
But I also had the chance to observe him and his students in the greenhouse talking about the plants. And for me, they just looked like plants, they're just barley plants. But they opened my eyes that there was a lot of other things going on that I wasn't seeing. And they talked topics about breeding and about plant morphology and, and genetics and cytogenetics. And I got quite interested and um, I got him to let me agree to work in his lab part time, to work in the lab in the greenhouse um, throughout the rest of my college career. And I was about to graduate and uh, Professor Suchia came by and he asked me, um, well, what are your plans next? And I said, well, I, I plan to go on the Peace Corps and try to help people. And he said, that's a very admirable thing. I really, really think that's excellent. But he said, I've noticed that you have an inclination towards science and um, maybe breeding and genetics. And he said, you could go on the Peace Corps and you certainly could help some people. But if you used your talent and your mind and went to graduate school and became a breeder or plant geneticist, you potentially could help a lot more people through your ability. So think about it. There's many ways to serve, and maybe this is an alternative one. So it's really an eye-opener, one of those junction points in your life that I realized there was something I enjoyed doing that actually could be something that could be helping. So I went on from there to the uh, University of California, Davis, to pursue a PhD in plant genetics and breeding. And it was a very interesting time to be in, um, in life sciences because up to that time, this includes breeding, medicine, everything. Everything biological was based on looking at the organism. You would look at an organism, whether it's pathology in a patient or yield in a plant or some character, and you look at the phenotype and you would make some deductions and decide what to do, but you never got to look at the cause. You never got to look directly back at the gene itself. We knew the genes were causing things, but we had no access to them. But that's how things were at that time. Uh, but it was a transition period. There was no molecular biology at that time. There was no DNA sequencing, no DNA markers, none of that it wasn't even the, in the vocabulary. But there was something called uh, biochemical genetics, which was a way that you could start studying the properties of particular biochemicals and even the genetics of them. And a very popular one was, was studying enzymes, which of course are proteins, so they're more directly linked to the actual gene itself. And uh, as you know, there's, there's many, many proteins in our, in our organism. So if you just extract the proteins and run them on a gel, you'll see so many different proteins, you just see a big mess. But they learned that you could take these protein extracts from a plant or an animal, separate them on electrophoresis on a gel, and then add the substrate for a particular enzyme coupled with a dye. And you could see the position on the gel where that enzyme was located. So this was called enzyme electrophoresis, and uh, it was very popular in two ways. One, it was used by people studying the proteins themselves. And it also began to be used, especially in taxonomy, as a trait, because these traits are very um, demonstrable, very heritable. So if you look at the left side of the gel, you see a number of individuals look identical. And to the right side, you see there's a slight difference in one of the bands. And that's a very repeatable characteristic, traceable to a single gene. And moreover, what we discovered is that you could make crosses between individuals with different banding patterns, and you could deduce the genetics of every one of those proteins. So this is quite powerful, and then you can start to move right back to the, to the, the cause of things. You're not necessarily going to be stuck out there at the whole organism level. So this really caught my attention. Uh, at this time, there was no such thing as molecular maps. There was no molecular breeding. There was no quantitative trait mapping. The word was not even part of the vocabulary. Um, but there was this electrophoresis, and I became very interested in looking at the genetics of as many enzymes as possible. It was not something at that time was deemed appropriate for a PhD thesis because there was no, there was no discipline. So I began uh, trying to construct a genetic map of as many protein coding enzymes as possible, and my thesis was something else. So during the day, I went to class and worked on my thesis research. And at night, in the evening, we began constructing the first, what you call molecular map of, of a plant, which was tomato. 
and it was published in 1980, about the time of my graduation. And it was, by today's standards, it was nothing. It was a, a genetic map with 20 markers on it. These are enzyme markers and related to the genes that encode these. But it was really different than any other map that had been created up to that time. All other maps were based on phenotypes like dwarfism or anthocyanus or whatever. This was based on the molecules. And these molecules, because they could be simply studied on a gel, you theoretically could use them for a lot of applications looking for other loci controlling other things or possibly quantitative traits. So this became the focus of my life for the next roughly 15 or 20 years. I just immersed myself in this. Um, and my next stop um, was Cornell University where I was hired as a professor in the plant breeding genetics department. And by this time, molecular biology i.e., DNA technology started becoming available. It became possible to extract DNA from plants. Prior to this, it was not. Restriction enzyme became available, southern blotting, the tools to actually start making maps at the DNA level. So we went full bore. Uh, we created the first high density genetic linkage map at the DNA level uh, for tomato and potato published in 92. Uh, we made one for rice in 94. We then went on to use these for various applications. Once we had a full map available, we began using it for quantitative trait mapping. Uh, we also, since these are DNA based, you can compare genes between species. So we started making comparative linkage maps like rice and maize. And ultimately, we use these maps or these markers to actually clone the genes causing traits of interest. So we published our first one was cloning of the disease resistance gene in 1993. And then by the year 2000, we cloned the first quantitative trait locus, the actual gene causing a quantitative trait. So it's a very productive and uh, stimulating period of my life. But one other thing I learned from it was that there was so much possible, but it was so limited by the ability to get data. So we go back to this first map we made in rice and tomato. A map like we published, which had about a thousand markers, today could be done in a matter of weeks easily. We spent a lot of people, I had a big lab, spent about three years collecting the data to make that map. And all the other projects we did, there was just a lot of time collecting the data. So it had great potential, but it was really limited by useful data. And the analysis was sort of a small piece of the action. It was about this time that a, a monumental idea came about in the life sciences, and that was um, up until now, we have looked at the outcome of processes, phenotype. But if we could actually read out the entire genetic blueprint of an organism, like humans, we would really transform biology. We'd look at the raw source and have the full blueprint before us. So this is monumental if it could work. If we actually do it, it would be changing how we approach life sciences. But the problem was at that time, it wasn't doable. There wasn't the technology to sequence the roughly 3,000 3, base pairs in the human genome. There wasn't the chemical engineering technology developed for it. There wasn't the computational tools. It was, it was a dream. And it was interesting, the dream was pretty compelling, but it was opposed by a lot of scientists because they knew it would suck up a lot of money that went to other research, and it may not work. But ultimately, it did work. Uh, the first human genome sequence was published in 2003, and the price tag one human genome, $2.7 billion. Now, most of that went to technology development. It didn't actually go to sequence of that one human genome. But you have to do all of that. But that technology development led the way for everybody else. So over the years, very rapidly, the cost of sequencing went down, such that um, 2014, you could sequence a whole human genome for $1,000. And today, you can sequence the majority of any genome with any organ the portion you need to make any decision for about $20. So it's really staggering how this has ramped up the availability of information. So this brought us to a new um, place in life sciences, and that was that before we were really limited by collecting large amounts of data. 
And now technology, engineering, and chemistry are moving in to fill that vacuum, creating such vast amounts of information that the dilemma was how are we going to use it to do something useful? How are we going to use it to make a decision or to make a biological discovery? This has brought very much to the forefront this problem of how do you make decisions in the new paradigm of genomics of biological research. Let's see if I can advance one more slide. Okay. Um, so this brought me to another stage in my career, I'd say a junction point in my career. Um, everybody that was thinking about biology to any extent at that time was thinking about the implications of the human genome project. What if it succeeds? What does it mean for institutions to train people in life sciences? What kind of instructors do we need? What kind of facilities do we need? So I became the head of a group of about 70, 70 faculty members with 20 departments, including the med school, vet school, life sciences, plant breeding, engineering, et cetera, who had the mission of drafting out an investment plan for the university in the future of life sciences. And so I went to many departments I never would have encountered before, like physics or mathematics or ethics, sociology, all these different ones to try to understand what was likely to happen. And the real eye opener came to me from two departments. One was high energy physics, uh, which one has a very strong department of physics. And at that time, there were two Nobel Prize winners in the department. So I went to their faculty meeting. I explained the idea of the Human Genome Project and so forth. And they stopped me right halfway through and they said, we know what's going to happen to your field because it happened in our field. And that is, in the energy of high energy physics, Prior to the consortium of high energy colliders, there was very limited data. But once countries went together and built these community facilities, it became lots of data. And the people that turn data into knowledge are mathematicians. So you should invest heavily in the mathematical computational sciences. Went to the astronomy department, and said the same thing. Now, astronomy and physics weren't talking to each other, but they had the same conclusion. They said, before the space telescopes, there was very limited data available for astronomers. When that came on board, we were inundated by data, and the people that turned data into knowledge and decision making are mathematicians, invest heavily in that. So we did. We invested a disproportionate amount of our funds in those fields. We built some whole new departments, the computational sciences, and it's been very successful. But in doing this, um, I had two parts of my personality. One, I was looking for Cornell, what should we do? And the other, I was meeting all these people from these fields that I'd never heard about and thinking about if these fields can transform life sciences in general, it must be true for plant breeding. And the one field that really struck me is a field called operations research. It's not one that most people training in biology or plant breeding so forth I've heard about. It's a, it's a field that emerged out of computer science and mathematics a few decades ago. And what it does is it looks at problems that have an almost infinite number of possible solutions and can find the optimal solution out of those huge number of possibilities. And it combines a number of tools from mathematical sciences, computational geometry. It's a very well developed discipline. But up until that time, almost all of its practical applications were not in the life sciences. It was meant in manufacturing or in transportation or finance. But I realized this field was perfect for plant breeding. I'll give you an example of how this field approaches a problem and why it's perfect for plant breeding. So uh, I'll give you a simple problem. Let's say that uh, you have a problem where you have seven objects of different weights and you want to select the object that weighs the most. But simple to do this, obviously 24 is the answer. Uh, in operations research, you have to formulate this into a formal mathematical statement. So the problem is called the objective. The objective is choose a unit that maximizes grams. Uh, now we're going to get a little more complicated, which is closer to real life including plant reading. We care about more than one thing. We want to maximize a subset it gets the most grams, but we can't spend more than $12. So now you have to look at two variables, and it gets hard to solve this visually because there's a lot of combinations. In um, 
operations research, these requirements are called constraints. So the constraint is can't you spend can't spend more than twelve dollars. And the beauty of operations research, you can have any number of constraints and you can still solve the problem. Um, you look at the possible uh, solutions to a problem. Feasible problems are those that don't uh, violate any constraint. That's what we care about looking at. And infeasible, we care about because they violate one or more of the constraints. Now, this is where operations research starts to diverge from the traditional approach we use, say, in plant breeding, is that um, you can solve this problem by looking at the individual items. For example, choose the heaviest object. And then the next heaviest object, you get 24 grams or 22 grams, and you get a solution better than random. You get, um, you know, 46 grams, but you're not sure it's the optimal solution. Operations research doesn't solve it that way. Essentially, examines or effectively examines all possible solutions and finds the best one. In this case, the best solution doesn't contain any of the heaviest grams, but you get 70 grams for your 12 dollars. So why is it ideally suited for plant breeding? Because essentially plant breeding is a manufacturing process. You're manufacturing new varieties out of raw material, which is genetic variation. And you're manufacturing them to design specifications, just like you do in operations research. So if you can formulate a breeding problem, such as I want a new variety that maximizes yield, for example, but I need to constrain the harvest date, the protein content for the end user, maybe the plant height for harvesting, disease resistance. You can have any number of constraints. Operations research offers a solution to this. I'll give you an example uh, where we actually are using operations research and it gives you, I think, a sense of the power of the technology. Um, this is something all breeders face. Let's say that you set design specification. Let's say it's in wheat. And you want to create a new variety that has met design specifications. Yield's probably the objective. You need to maximize it above a certain level in order for the growers to want to grow it. Then you have a whole series of other traits you have to take care of to meet some required level. So let's say that you have 200 lines in your breeding nursery, and you, you look at each of those and Every one of those meets some of the constraints, but none of them meet all the constraints. So you don't have a new product there. This is what plant breeding faces every day. You're trying to create something new from something that exists. So what you do is using some type of thought process or algorithm, you choose a subset of these lines and remake them with the hope or expectation in the next generation or the generation after that, you will identify that line that meets a design specification. The problem is with just 200 lines, how many possible subsets can you choose? It's 10 to the 60 of possible subsets. It's unimaginable. And breeders, no one could possibly, the thinking process, solve that. Breeders have ways of approaching this, but can't possibly take into consideration all the possible solutions. But operations research can. It can feed in what data is available, usually phenotypic and genotypic data. And given all the available data, find the best solution to that problem. So this comes to my next uh, transition in my career. Uh, this is about 2006 that I really began thinking about operations research, a little before that, and uh, realized it was a field I thought could really be transformational in plant breeding. I was in the Cornell plant breeding department, genetics department at that time was roughly 50 years old. And I really wanted to pursue this, this new approach. But the problem was is that operations research wasn't part of any life sciences. It was a whole different college. It was a college of engineering. The people that were trained in operations research were not gonna to come to a plant breeding department as a postdoc. They typically would go to manufacturing or Wall Street and make more money than I did as, as a professor. And um, the ability to get a position open in the College of Agriculture from another college like engineering at that time was almost zero. So I had a decision point. I could, I had a very comfortable job, fully tenured, 
well-paid, nice, nice view from my office. I could stay at Cornell and probably not be able to work on this thing that interested me, which could be a better use of my creative instinct than staying where I was. Or I could try to leave and form a company, which may or may not be successful, but it would be a pathway to try. So, of course, that comes with a quandary. What, you know, what do you do? Do you leave something comfortable and go to the unknown and maybe fail? Or do you stay where you are and try to do the best you can? And then I thought about it. Okay, you have to do the best you can at any point in life. And besides, I get the lockpicking set from when I was a kid. So, if my new career failed, I'd always go into lockpicking. So, I did. I worked together with some co-founders and we set out to form a company focused on operations research. And life got very interesting. I don't know if any of you have tried to start a company, but it's not something most scientists are trained for or very adept at. And the first thing you need to start a company is at least some money. And depending on how big and how much capital, you know, you need, it can be quite a bit of money. So, I started talking to venture capitalists and we would tell the story. Here's, you know, plant breeding. Here's the discipline. Here's why it's important to the world. It creates a value for the world, also feeds people. We have an approach that can make it better, faster, more efficient. And we think it makes a good business. And I talked to like three or four venture capitalists and they'd all shake their head. Oh, yeah, yeah, sounds very interesting. And, you know, nothing would ever happen. And then finally, someone took me aside and said, look, you know, the problem is you're not answering the question they want you to answer. They want you to specifically answer, why do you want to start this company? And there is only one answer. The answer is, I want to start this company because I want to make as much money as I can as fast as I can. <laughs> so I thought to myself, well, anyone starting a company, of course, wants to be profitable. But in my heart, I couldn't really say that. That wasn't really the entirety of what drove me. So I never did say that. We, we lowered our, our ask and began a much more modest company and built it from the ground up. And we did not have to take this route. Unfortunately, I'm glad we did that because we fully control the company today. So now I'll tell you a little bit about the company and a little bit about the technology, not too deep because of the time, the time issues. But the company was founded in 2006 and we have two divisions, one here in Ithaca, New York, where I'm located, genetics division. We have an in vitro propagation division located in Chiapas, Mexico. And these two together uh, form our company. And the company works in three interconnected domains. We provide breeding and genetic services with our technology developed largely through the field of operations research. We have more than 100 uh, optimization algorithms that work together in combinations with a um, uh, web-based interface and a lot of cloud computing behind it that can be used in breeding. And we do our services on behalf of seed plantation, consumer good industries. Um, and occasionally we have been involved in some public projects. For example, we're involved in the Gates banana breeding project um, that's, that's funded by Gates. We're, we're a member of that. Our Mexico division provides in vitro propagation services. We're one of the largest producers of in vitro um, plants, especially uh, tropical plants like banana, plantain, agave, uh, coffee, et cetera. And uh, we also have our own internal breeding programs that use our propagation technologies and our breeding technology, especially in tropical crops. So the genetics division, which is located here, which, which I spend most of my time, is essentially just focused on looking at where decisions are made in plant breeding and trying to make the system more efficient bringing in new algorithms and the appropriate amount of data. And again, a lot of our solutions have come from the field of operations research. So again, the, the, the specialty is designing, executing breeding programs in an operations research framework. And what we do is we look at breeding programs where optimization and prediction can leverage to accomplish breeding pros and, and high value products. So we're looking for rate limiting steps, where are you spending money, where are you spending time, and where can a better, a better decision be made. So we have a whole suite of technology developed, and depending on the crop we're working or on the um, partner we're working with, we use different aspects of this. 
and we use historical data, obviously, if there's data required, we look what's a minimum amount of necessary data to get the right decision. Now, at the other end comes a breeding plan and a product pipeline. And our goal is to do it faster, uh, do it at a lower cost and get a higher outcome. So again, our, our, we really, our operations research focus, we start with design specifications. If you don't know what you wanna create, how can you possibly create it? And then we look for the shortest path to create that product. And one of the benefits of this is we can get higher selection gains. Also, we can handle multiple traits simultaneously without the need for index selection, which has been one of the real limitations of breeding is how do you take different traits and meaningfully put them into an index? By operations research, you don't need to. It handles all traits simultaneously. It can identify which traits are limiting so you can make the adjustments, but there's no index selection involved. So we have, uh, just to give an optimized breeding start um, uh, example, I want to not spend too much time here, but you know, breeding starts is the biggest decision a breeder has to make. You have to make populations for breeding that have genetic variation, and you create those from founding lines, crossing two or more founders. And it's this decision, is the breeders choosing the right combinations and the right breeding population that has the largest impact on both the cost of the program and the probability of success. And for most commercial breeding programs, it's also the most expensive part of the R&D. Evaluating breeding start populations sucks up most of the time and money in, in breeding. So just for example, this is somewhat of what I showed in wheat, but if you have 500 lines available for a particular market segment, and you had the budget for 100 breeding start populations per year, with two-way starts, there's 125,000 possible two-way starts. So you only get to sample 0.08% of the possibilities. With three-way starts, it's even smaller. And four-way starts, it's almost infinitesimally small. So this, I call this a breeding start dilemma. What we've developed is an approach that given all the information available can help the breeder choose their breeding starts most likely to give new products that meet the design specifications. And we call this the optimized breeding start technology. Um, it allows you to optimally sample and recombine potential genetic lines to produce high performing breeding populations according to design specification uh, to predict uh, gains multiple generations in the future and again, allow you to predict multiple traits simultaneously, even if they're interactive or pleiotropic. It not only identifies which combinations are the right ones to cross, and each combination is only known in the context of the other combinations, but it also informs the right number of offspring from each one. So you don't necessarily, you should not optimally sample the number of offspring from each breeding start, the number of offspring will be determined by the design specifications and the, the whole set of, of breeding starts. So again, at the end of this, our, our goal is to have less time and less money spent to get to new products with, with higher gains. And I'll just end up here with giving um, an example from tomato, which actually is, you know, vegetable crops are some of those difficult crops to work with because the design, design specifications are enormous. So this is for uh, pro this is for um, glasshouse high-tech tomatoes grown in Northern Europe. Uh, the objective, like most crops in the design specs, is maximize marketable yield. But there are 21 constraints that had to be taken care of. And all 21 had to be met, otherwise you couldn't market it. So it's, it's, it's an incredibly challenging problem to solve. But we could feed in all this information, identify the correct breeding starts, and within five years from the first crosses, we're able to produce new hybrids that outperform um, our partner's portfolio, but more importantly, it outperform the competition's portfolio anywhere from 12 to 17 percent in yield while meeting all the design specifications. So it's not magic, it's just that when you're able to make a better decision at multiple steps, and take into account multiple traits simultaneously that you have a better chance uh, of reaching success. So we've been, in year, we've been in business now for about 15 years and we have a chance to test uh, and use and develop our technologies across a broad spectrum of crops from 
diploids to polyploids to vegetatively propagated, um, seed propagated hybrids, line breeding, et cetera. And we've used that information to help us further improve our, our, our platforms uh, from the data coming in from the various projects that we've worked on. So that's kind of a very brief personal and scientific story. And I hope it, hope it explains what we're doing scientifically, but also sort of how I've tried to lead my life going back to what I think my parents said, which is happiness is helping others. And you have to identify what it is you have to offer and what's the best format to offer that. And I may not have done it perfectly, but I've tried to do it according to what I thought was important. I'm especially pleased to speak to all of you because all of you I know working at Senate and other related institutions are really out to make agriculture more productive and sustainable for the world's inhabitants. So you really, you, you dem demonstrate the concept that happiness is helping others. And this is extremely important for having, I think, a peaceful world, but also a sustainable world. So I'll end by thanking all of you and I'll be very happy to answer any questions if I can. Thank you. Thank you very much, Steve. Uh, very interesting presentation. So I would like to invite the audience to uh, raise their hands so they can uh, make a question or comment. Uh, or if you prefer, you can write a message at the chat box, but we can start. I invite you to, to open your microphone or raise your hand so you can give your comment question. I don't see hands raised. <laughs> <laughs> Everybody fell asleep. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, I don't think so. I don't think so. Um, okay, here we have a comment from Gideon Kuzman. Uh, great presentation. What kind of algorithms uh, do you uh, do you use? Um, Gideon is an economist and, ma and mathematical programming adept. So the, the question was, what kind of algorithms do we use? Was that the yes. question? Yeah, yes, we use, that's the question. Yeah, we have, we have a team of people from mathematical and engineering sciences that bring sort of different approaches and they use different algorithms. But for operations research, they especially rely upon um, solvers that were developed specifically for the field. One of this is a Garobi, which you may be familiar with. So a lot of our our programming is in, in Groby, but we also use other um, um, platforms for our programming, but everything's tied together in web-based applications. So when you use, when someone uses our algorithms, they come to a web-based interface, which looks like any other software, and it's designed for breeders. And then they access different parts to make decisions. And behind the scenes, it's reaching out to different solvers and cloud computing but the user is not having to do that manually. It's just all coming back sort of behind the scenes. So it's a, it's a broad mixture of things happening behind the scenes. Okay, thank you. Question. Oh, sorry. Yes. Uh, we have a raised hand, uh, Tanda Dilayo, Dilayo, sorry. Please, uh, Tanda, open. Yes, go ahead. Hi, uh, Steve, can you hear me? Yes, uh huh. Yeah, okay. Uh, yeah, uh, th thank you for that in, uh, in insightful uh, presentation. Um, uh, just wondering, I mean, so from your experience, what kind of you know infrastructure and you might need? I I'm thinking from the point of view of uh, the CG, uh, trying to you know think about something like this. I mean, I can see where it might actually fit. In a, in a large multinational breeding organization, you know, with a little bit more resources than we do, and try to build a team that does something like this. Uh, but for us, you know, with uh, the limited resources and you know, kind of levels of funding going, on, I'm kind of wondering where you, what you think might be the best way for CG centers to to try something uh, similar to this. It'd be something that we could maybe outsourced to a company such as yours, or you think it's something that 
can be done by you know the research organizations internally. Yeah, it's a very, very good question. I think you know if we look into the future, solutions to problems are probably going to come from multiple sources, public organizations and private organizations working together. It kind of changes over time. Uh, for example, most of our work up until now has been with private companies. Um, and the reason for that, the reason that they engage us, some of these companies are quite large, some of them are smaller, but the cost of developing all of these background algorithms, software, making sure it works well can be time consuming and expensive when people really want to just access it and use it and, and move on. And some smaller companies can't possibly afford to do that. So they, they come in and make a contract or partnership with a company like ours. Uh, more recently, we actually are working with a um, international project on um, transforming banana breeding into a hybrid type crop, which I won't go into the details, um, but it's with uh, GATE funded and with IETA and other partners. And we're providing our expertise and we're using some of our algorithms on behalf of that project. So I don't think anything's out of the question. I think the main thing is keep in mind, what is the goal for society? The goal for society for me is to produce better plants quicker for a sustainable agriculture. And you put together whatever kinds of people to work together as you need to do that. And it can very well allow for public activities, public institutions like Senate and for private institutions to be part of it. I don't think it's exclusive for, for how this works. And, you know, how you do that probably depends on the situation, but I think the future, you know, will need to be a mixture of, of both public and private. Thank you. Thank you, um, thank you very much. Uh, we have here a comment um, from um, Jan. What's uh, the advantage or difference of using your method over index selection? Yeah, the, the, the challenge with index selection, um, you're taking a number of traits, you know, sometimes 10 or more traits, which everyone is different, like yield versus fruit quality, uh, for, you know, fruit quality and flavor versus fruit size versus disease resistance, and trying to put them together into one value, the value of the index. Well, how do you weight those different things? How, you know, how much does yield matter compared to disease resistant, compared to fruit quality? It's really impossible. It's a very subjective thing. And even if you do do it, it doesn't scale in a linear fashion with value. What you really need to say, in most cases, what really matters, first priority, is you want to maximize the yield, because that's what gives growers um, a way to make more profit. It also gives society more in terms of productivity. And everything else becomes a requirement and a constraint. You want to have you know, the flavor at a certain level, so people want to eat it. You have to have, you know, four or five disease resistance are mandatory, but you don't have to put that into an index. Operations research never creates an index. It says, given the constraints, I'll look for a solution. And if there is no solution, I'll come back and say, with those constraints where you've set them, there's not a solution available right now. Don't even try it. You may then come back and say, okay, which of the constraints are, are tight constraints? They're hurting it. Maybe you've been so insistent upon a certain level of flavor that's really unattainable. You'll come back and say, this is too high and you can adjust it, but there's never an index involved. It's just automatically allowing you to make adjustments in the constraints. And it takes into account all the interactions and pleiotropy and comes back with answers and you're never forced to go into this artificial one value index selection. I don't know if I'm explaining that well, uh, but that's that's how I see it. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, now we're yeah, three. that explains it. Thank you, Jan. <clears throat> now we have um, <clears throat> three more uh, hands raised. Uh, Dorcus uh, Gammon, would you please uh, open your micro? Yes, please go ahead. Thank you, Steve, uh, for the nice presentation. Uh, given that you have been working with banana for a while, I wanted to know what has been your uh, experience 
And what advice would you give, for example, to a team which is uh, working on operational research for multiple crops with diverse genetics and diverse uh, environments? Thank you. Um, so if I understand the question, it was the first part was about banana and how banana might relate to this. Is that correct? Yeah, what has been your experience working with banana? Well, first of all, I have, I have to say right from the very beginning, I'm no banana expert. I, I come in from the outside, but it's true of all the crops that we work on now. And that's one nice thing for me is that I don't have to be an expert. I can bring my experience and try to learn from the people I work with. So what I've learned about banana, I've learned in the past three years with this project and um, in understanding the needs and also the constraints of the system. And the one thing that struck me, we, me most about banana is um, it has one very serious limitation and that's sexual recombination. But if you look at what drives evolution, how about, how about evolution to succeed, there's two pillars. One is genetic variation. Without genetic variation, there's no evolutionary process. Without meiotic recombination, you can't use that genetic variation effectively. That's what gives rise to all of the organisms that occupy, occupy the earth. It's also the same foundation of breeding. Breeding is basically evolution um, with uh, humans doing the selecting. And banana, because of the nature of the product being sterile, because people eat sterile bananas and being polyploid, it's had very little sexual recombination. In fact, the most widely grown dessert banana, Cavendish, which is number one, is a 2,000 year old variety that's had no sexual recombination in 2,000 years. So how can you possibly use genetic diversity if you can't recombine it? So our big focus on the banana is devising a new system utilizing banana natural variation, of which there's plenty. There's wonderful germplasm collections around the world. And rethinking banana as a hybrid crop with um, heterotic groups of both diploid and tetraploids, where you can get mitotic recombination, crossing them to make triploids, which give good products because they're sterile and don't have seed. So it's really been trying to find the bottleneck in the system and then find a way to address it through a partnership program, which is what we're doing. So that's been my experience with banana and I'm extremely excited about the prospects for it. Thank you. Um, now I would like to get the microphone to Sarah Horn. Please, Sarah. Hey, Steve, thanks, thanks for the nice presentation. Um, working in, in ag and, and very much so in, in international ag, logistics really make or break any of the science that we want to try and implement. So how do you factor in logistics as part of the optimization process that you're doing, in addition to um, the normal cost that we count of in terms of, of pounds, dollars, cents, et cetera? Thank you. Uh, when you say logistics, are you referring to like logistics of how you get new genetic materials to the people that need to grow them or shipping the end products or what type of logistics are you thinking about? Logistics is part of the breeding process. I mean, genetic gain is one of the big key elements in there is time. Um, so how do you consider the time involved in the process, whether it is time to move parental material to make initial crosses, time for analyses, time yeah. to distribute I see. Yeah. material for testing, et cetera? Yeah, it's, it's a good point. So the first thing we do when we come into a new crop or a new partnership is we look at the, the commodity, the species being bred, and we look at the current pipeline, the current logistics. What does it look like? What's been going on? You know, it has to start somewhere with the genetic diversity, and then someone's having to usually cross and make recombination and do maybe multiple generations if they're trying to get inbreds or doing something else. We look at every step in the sequence, how much labor resources are needed to each step and how much time is each step taking and we go through the whole system then we ask the question which of these steps can be through a better decision making or resource deployment be reduced in other words for example in the breeding starts if you're able 
to make the very best breeding starts, instead of screening, say, 100,000 progeny in the field to have a chance of having a gain of 5%, maybe you just need 2,000 because they're 2,000 better designed. Or if you're, you know, they're normally going, say, three generations of inbreeding, you can ask the question, how much is that gaining you relative to the outcome? So there's no one specific answer, but we look at it as a process and the operations research is a process optimization process. And we're looking what points are variables, where's the cost, and what can we do to reduce the cost, reduce the time and have a higher chance of an output at the end. For every crop, it's been different what we've changed or, or modified depending on the logistics of that crop. I don't know if that addresses your question or? Yeah, thanks. Thank you. Um, I'm going to read three questions. I don't know whether we have enough time or maybe I can just give the microphone to Bodo. Yes, Bodo, please open your micro. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, hello and uh, thank you so much, Steve, for this um, uh, full story and uh, I'm sure for those who know your former projects a little more, it is clear that you gave a very sparse account of all the significant achievements uh, of your life. So thank you very much for, for telling this story to us here. And uh, I would also like to ask uh, something with respect to the bananas, although uh, it had already been covered to some extent by Dorcas. And uh, my question is specifically uh, looking at the bananas as a sterile crop. Uh, we see that most of these crosses are highly sterile, but uh, plant breeding depends on the production of seed as the, as the uh, base of uh, uh, materializing recombination. Now, mm -hmm. uh, thinking of that, uh, how can your method uh, be used maybe uh, in trying to, you know, to repeat what nature did 2000 years ago in trying of resynthesizing these bananas, perhaps using uh, fertile parents. Thank you. Yeah, you're kind of breaking up a little bit, but I think, I think what you were asking was, how would you approach this in banana given, you know, you have 2000 years Cavendish has been around and it's sterile and, how do you break how do you break this problem? And the thought process was you have to solve the recombination if you if you have a system where you have little little or no mitic recombination, it's always going to be a slow moving process. And one of the things that came to my mind when I heard the banana story was how this has been addressed in um, in other crops, for example, um, in uh, watermelon, you know watermelon is a diploid and uh, has seed, obviously, and a lot of recombination, but people began to desire or want seedless watermelons. And one way to make them seedless is make them triploid because obviously you're sterile, but when they're triploid, you can't breed them. So what they did is develop essentially um, a two heterotic pools, a diploid pool and a tetraploid pool, and you can get recombination within each pool. And then when you cross them, the hybrids, they're sterile. So it became like a breeding system. Heterotic groups are a diploid pool, a tetraploid pool. You breed recombined within the pools. You pull out inbreds, find good combining ability, and sell products. So for me, banana, banana was very similar in its needs. You need to have a sterile product like triploids because you don't want to be chewing on hard seeds and bananas. But you need these fertile pools to do recombination. The only difference between what I said in banana and, um, and watermelon is with banana, you don't need to make inbred lines because you aren't selling seeds. I mean, the, the hybrid seed of a watermelon is a hybrid seed, so the hybrids have to be uniform, meaning you have to have inbreds to create them. With banana, when you cross a diploid and tetraploid, Neither one has to be homozygous because you're propagating vegetatively. You just have to be able to predict which combination is likely to produce an offspring that has good properties and then you vegetatively propagate it. So the story 
seem to match very close what happened in watermelon or even sugar beets. And the need was you have to start somewhere. You have to start creating those pools and finding the combinations that start creating the first products and applying on that the tools already available through predictive reading, things I talked about and other people are developing and just move this crop to a crop that has recombining heterotic groups and high performing hybrids that are vegetatively propagated. And it doesn't happen in a day, obviously, but you have to start and it seemed like a good way forward. So that's, that's the approach that we've been pursuing with our partners, obviously. So um, I don't know if I answered your question or if you had a slightly different question or. Thank you. Um, in fact, I am seeing this uh, problem of uh, genome mosaicism of the bananas, which is hampering uh, you know, the possibility of them. But anyway, thank you. Thank you very much. So I think we have uh, reached our uh, time. Um, so uh, Steve, may I, we have some few questions in the chat box. Maybe we can address those to you by email. And then if you have time, you can uh, return them. And if that is OK, hopefully. Sure, and no problem. Thank you. Thank you very much. So I don't know whether you have any final uh, message. Uh, thank you very much for your inspiring work. So. Any final message? No, thank you all and keep up the good work and keep the faith. Thank you very much. <laughs> so on behalf of CMIT, uh, we thank you uh, for this uh, interesting uh, presentation, designing and executing optimized breeding programs using operations research technology. Um, thank you, Stephen Stankley, Chief Technology Officer at Nature, Resort, uh, Nature Source Improved Plants. So we will, um, be addressing the questions in the chat box to you. And also, uh, this presentation is going to be available at the CIMIT webcast. Uh, so you can share or uh, you can uh, refer to this presentation later. Thank you very much, Steve. Thank you all. Have a good day. Good evening. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you all.